Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. We have another fun-filled mailbag episode for you guys today. And thank you, by the way, to those of you who have been sending in questions. We hope that you're finding these episodes to be informative and edifying. I'm joined today by Scott and Chris. Hi, guys. Hi, Bree. Hey, Bree. Thanks for being here mm-hmm. and being willing Excited. to answer these questions sight unseen. Are you? Do you guys get nervous? I don't. don't? I yeah. I love this stuff. I I listen to a lot of Q and A's for fun. I'm kind of nerdy like that, so yeah. I get excited about the opportunity to get to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, if it helps anybody, then praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, you don't get nervous at all? I, Not even a little bit? I No, I'm very interested in what the questions yeah. are going to be. And we could call those nerves, perhaps, because yeah. I'm so interested. Okay. But uh, they range so much, you know, over the years that we've been doing this. They it's just true. They range a lot. So it's, it's From fun. UFOs to Old Testament to... Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So all, let's see what we got. Stuff. Yeah, we've got a good range of questions today. Um, let's start. So if Adam and Eve were the first humans on Earth, where did Cain and Abel's wives come from? Cain and Abel's wives. Yeah. Great question, everybody. I wish I had like a little Genesis. sound thing where I could do like Jeopardy noises or, you know, just add some interesting effects. Yeah, absolutely. While you guys are flipping your Bible pages here. Oh, yeah. Flipping here. Let's get to, uh, I'm going to go with Genesis 4 here. Yep. Starting in verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And so there's where Cain came from. And now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground and kind of goes through that whole story. I think um, if you fast forward a little bit into Genesis chapter four, um, you get a sense for these lineages, the descendants of Adam all the way to Noah in Genesis chapter five. I think the safest thing to say is it was part of their offspring, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have uh, kids that were coming and then multiplying out of one family. And of course that would be seen as incest today. Right. But in that day with the multiplication that was happening, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, seen in the same way. Uh, even biologically wasn't the same. So that, that would be the answer that I would put to that plain and simple. Yeah, it's good. And we could, you know, you could consider going to places like Answers in Genesis. Sure. Um, there's a couple other um, institutes on- online. I mean, this is something that we have to admit limitations of yeah. full understanding. Um, yeah. But we, we, we see we see what we see in the scripture. And the scripture does not seek to answer every question of our curiosity. There are better answers and worse answers, but there's not always like the pure only possibility yeah. as well sure. something like this. But I think it's important just to say that we can infer from the text right. that. Right. And um, I, I don't think it's, it is it is super clear. This is why the question is being asked. But yeah, as it started and played out, I think that's the way to understand how that took place. Mm-hmm. That they'd be more common even to mention males that were being born even over females in terms of a record and sure. genealogy and those kind of things as well. So mm-hmm. likely why they weren't included. Right. And it's not clear about like how much time was passed, like that Cain and Abel were a particular age necessarily. So like the population could look really different from yeah. maybe how it reads. Yeah. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Cool. Absolutely. Well, maybe that one was too easy. For you it, to that one that one's just more one of those curiosity yeah. ones. Yeah. I'm not sure how that helps in the Christian life necessarily, <laughs> yeah. but it, it could be something where, you know what that, the, the thing I think about that question is um, that's somebody when you have a roommate, a non-Christian roommate in college or something like that, or you're trying to minister or witness to someone at the gym, mm-hmm. and that's their like one they learned about on the history channel, and we're like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. So how did that happen? Kind of thing. And um, more like stumpers. And so if that helps, just give a basic understanding. But usually what I would do with those questions, if they're given to me, is I would get to the try to get around that question. I I think usually those are deflection questions that kind of get around somebody's heart. And I would go back to, yeah, but the general, let's let's talk about instead of the things trying to find error or like um, stumps, stump the person type of thing, let's get back to the gospel. Let's get back to who God is, who you are, how this plays out in the world, its evidences in life, what Christ did on the cross, resurrection, those kind of things, because usually that's just to get you off subject so they can, you know, not right. feel the heat. The, the truth of Christianity, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, for example, re- rests on the resurrection, the claims of historical true resurrection. Uh, it doesn't rest on a question like, where did Cain's 
wife come from. You right. know what I mean? And yeah. we have to be sure that we're not uh, uh, so taken aback that we just uh, we act like the whole thing could crumble if I can't give an adequate answer to something that we may or may not be able to know for sure or clearly. Where we do know what we know through revelation uh, mm-hmm. with what the gospel is and what it what it does in our lives and our ultimate moral need before a holy God um, and how that gets that gets worked out through Christ. Right. Yeah. All right. Second question: If I am praying to the Holy Spirit and He reveals something to me that would edify someone else in the body, then how does that differ from prophecy? Uh, well, because of what prophecy is. What is it? Yeah, prophecy is an actual word from the Lord, a revelation, a revealing of a word, a message from God to a person to deliver something. So you see prophecy in the New Testament with like Agabus, for example, in Acts 21, a message about Paul, that he was going to be taken, he was going to be bound, he was going to be given over to the Romans, all that stuff that was going to happen, right? But then you see clear evidence of prophecy, for example, in the Old Testament prophets, and I think one of the things is let's not shift prophecy. And this is what happens. There's a downgrading of prophecy that takes place in our day to justify that the gifts are operating in exactly the same way they were before. So instead of making prophecy something less, which is easy to do, kind of a lowercase p prophecy, let's go back to where the prophets were very clear in the Old Testament, both the major prophets and the minor prophets, declaring, thus saith the Lord, and proclaiming a message versus what that is, is getting a sense in your spirit of a leaning or an inclination from the Holy Spirit. Now, what I would say is, can that happen? Of course that can happen. Is that prophecy? No, I wouldn't say that it is. And here's why that's so important. Because if you're not um, separating the two, you're actually going to undermine the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. By combining the two, you actually lessen what the Holy Spirit is doing. I think one of the things we have to fight for is we're for all that the Holy Spirit does. So can he put an inclination on someone's heart that would minister to someone else, even the truth of God's word? Yes. But I wouldn't put that in the category of like real, actual, both Old or New Testament prophecy. Some people would make the argument that prophecy is both foretelling, uh, i.e. get a message that hasn't been told before, and you're sharing something for, perhaps about the future, or forthtelling, a message that had already existed that has now been being dispensed to some other people or, or group or whatever. Um, but ultimately, New Testament prophecy was a revelation from the Word of God to somebody gifted with that gift, different than a feeling or a sense. It wasn't subjective, in other words. Yeah. Read the question again. If I am praying to the Holy Spirit and He reveals something to me that would edify someone else in the body, then how does that differ from prophecy? If I am praying to the Holy Spirit and He reveals... Something to me that would edify someone yeah. else. So we've yeah. just got some presuppositions going on and assumptions there that he revealed something to me and treating it like an unalterable fact, mm-hmm. treating it a more than a leaning, more than an inclination. But it comes there. There's some history there. There's probably some uh, church background. Uh, you're being taught in a right. certain manner to mm-hmm. say the Holy Spirit revealed something to me that would edify them. I would. I would just say, boy, I. I I, to, to, to Scott's point, yeah, I, I really felt uh, I felt led, and even by God, I felt led by the Lord to encourage you in this. Hopefully, it's not the idea of I know for sure you're going to get this job. That's an irresponsible thing to say. The Holy Spirit revealed this to me, even when it comes true. It's irresponsible because very oftentimes it won't come true, and it can do devastating things. It doesn't always, but it can. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the humility to say I was in the Word, praying to the Holy Spirit, which is fine, and and, and felt a strong conviction that I should say this to you. I just want to encourage you. That's what we call it. Yeah. We call it encouragement. Those are good. And that's wonderful that's to be led by God yeah. by that. Yeah, it's good. Didn't you have a message in First Corinthians that you kind of touched on this? I did, and I will by the time we okay. get to uh, the, the rest of this series as it plays out. We'll dive into more of that gift, how it's operating today. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, guys, we're moving along. Third question how may we be certain that all or some of the Apocrypha or Deuterocanon is not meant to be canon if it is still preserved? Is it possible Martin Luther made any mistakes in this? Can we please define Apocrypha and Deuterocanon? Yeah, Apocrypha is the intertestamental writings between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So there was this period of time, say 435 to 450 years of silence, prophetic silence before the coming of Jesus Christ. And there were a lot of Jewish writings, some that are very helpful, um, 
that were, um, you know, used in a way to keep track history, uh, used in a way to continue to develop sort of the Jewish culture in a lot of ways and, and developed and built off some spiritual themes from the Old Testament. Um, but is not considered canonized scripture. And the reason it's not considered canonized scripture is for a whole bunch of different reasons. One, the Old Testament itself identified that there was going to be a silence. That's in the book of Malachi, that there mm -hmm. was going to be this prophetic silence before the dawning of the coming of the Messiah. The new covenant. The new covenant, yeah, right. the, exactly. And so um, so Malachi says it. I, uh, Jesus goes through it when he talks about um, tr tracking the history of the Old Testament from Abel to Zechariah, which is basically that time frame. Um, and so th there's identification of clear, distinctive, um, not to mention as you get into the writings, you can start dealing with the, f the, the fallacies that you said pseudepigrapha, which is essentially, uh, I think you did, or something close. Okay, I'm adding that word then. <laughs> pseudepigrapha. You, you more, words, that, uh, more words. Another word to define. Yeah. And, well, pseudepigrapha is essentially like a, a letter that was written by someone who claims a name. It's not really their name. Okay. So pseudo lie, yeah. not true. Like um, pseudonym. Pigrapha, grapha, yeah. writing. So right. a pseudepigrapha would be someone that's claiming to have written a letter, but that wasn't really who wrote it kind okay. of thing. And so there, there, there are those issues as well. Uh, some of it is as fantastical. Uh, fantasy, uh, and, and that uh, plays out in some of the pieces of the Apocrypha as well. So anyway, there's a number of different reasons why clear both from the Bible and from an examination of those actual texts that reveal that in some sense they're not historically accurate. Sometimes they're pseudepigraphal. Uh, Jesus made clear what the Old Testament consisted of. Malachi was clear at the ending of the Old Testament that there would be this silence period before the dawning of the new covenant and Messiah. That's good. I don't know. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Did I miss another piece of that or was that? Um, so I feel like there might be the question asker might be distinguishing perhaps a small difference between Apocrypha and Deuterocanon. Do you understand it would be the same thing? Uh, well, so when he's, they're talking about the Martin Luther part, yeah. you know, I mean, I think one of the things that you have to understand is that the Catholics would have their Bibles filled with all of this stuff as mm -hmm. well. And so when Martin Luther was going through and evaluating the, um, uh, legitimacy of the canon and establishing for himself what, which of those books really belonged in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, there was a consideration of all of the books that were considered in the Catholic canon, which would have included the apocryphal books and the Deuterocanon. Right. We've got even a couple of just words from Jesus uh, with a first century understanding that um, the Canon was closed. The Old Testament, pardon me, Old Testament was closed. Uh, John five thirty nine. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. That was a closed deal. Nobody was treating that intertestamental intertestament period as scripture then. And this isn't like singularly proof, but just interesting words of Jesus. And again, the, the Jewish understanding that the law, uh, the prophets and the Psalms, like Luke 24, 44, yep. um, uh, these things I speak spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Um, that's the, you know, the law of the prophets and the, the Psalms or the wisdom literatures. That's the threefold division of the, of the uh, Old Testament. Sure. It's clear that by the first century, that was that was what it was. It had been about 400 years since Malachi, as was foretold. Uh, that prophecy was gone until the final great prophet, John the Baptist, came. Um, and then, obviously, Jesus on the heels of that. So we've done a lot of defining of terms. Did we answer the question? Could you read it to us again? Yeah. How may we be certain that all or some of the Apocrypha slash Deuterocanon is not meant to be canon if it is still preserved? Mm -hmm. Is it possible Martin Luther made any mistakes in this? Well, I, yeah, I would say we've answered that question for the most part, and that Martin Luther wasn't the only one involved in establishing yeah. the canonicity of the mm -hmm. scriptures, that we well, have tons of... Go ahead. And it was over a thousand years before Martin Luther, at least, that right. church... The that, canon that, had a... No, that, that the church councils recognized what the New Testament, Old Testament was, even then... Um, that's oftentimes treated like, well, geez, it took so long and some church council made up what was about. No, it was so clearly circulated, mm -hmm. uh, so so pervasive in the in the world over the first few hundred years of Christianity that the Old Testament, which was done and really not, that wasn't even argued about, but it was what is in the New Testament and it was the apostles' writings and precious few others um, that were clearly demonstrated to be from God. Absolutely. And, uh, and it wasn't that a council made 
made it into the Bible, and Martin Luther certainly didn't either, um, but that it was defined as such. And oftentimes it took a council, um, we could think of several councils that defined certain things. They did not make it up in the council, but they settled an issue. They dealt oftentimes with issues as they arose, and they had and they had councils to clearly delineate what was the Word of God, what was in the Word of God, what the teaching of the Trinity was, for example. They didn't, they didn't make it up through a council, though, and that no. is a big It's a big misunderstanding, too. Yeah. Yeah, because think about a council. The reason you have a council is to um, clarify something. Something is off. Something is errant. Um, and you come together and really establish from a biblical perspective what is there. So to say that the council invented it, oh, it's a, the canon is an invention of the fourth century. No, it's not. It just was that was the time when it needed to be clarified that what was assumed amongst many people needed to be absolutely understood and, and solidified. And so you go back in the in the first century, uh, second century writings, and you can find people that are as close to closely connected as um, ap- the Apostle John's disciples wow. who speak into uh, the identification and we can track all 27 books of the New Testament and early, early writings that were identified as being inspired by the uh, by the Holy Spirit. So just to add that to the rest of why I would consider that to be pretty straightforward. And yeah, Martin Luther wasn't, wasn't the first one, nor uh, one of the more important ones in that. Yeah. When I read this question, I was thinking about um, the message you did um, in the series Anchored on the Scriptures. So if you're listening, that'd be a great um, sermon to watch back um, from our website. Yeah, it's, it's in the series Anchored and called The Scriptures. Yeah. Also, F.F. F. Bruce has a great book called The Canon of Scripture. Uh, that's just kind of a historical one. It's a little bit heady, but it is great in terms of breaking down some of the categories I just shared in brief that he goes into very much detail on that helps break down where you see all the errors and the flaws that the Bible books don't have. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, next question. In 1 Corinthians 14, is there a general principle for rhetorical intelligibility? In the text, Paul is speaking quite literally about language and how understanding leads to edification. Could the same general principle be applied in terms of how we speak? In other words, could unclear speech in a language that is understood be in violation of this passage? Uh, it's not what was in violation of this passage. Uh, so, I, So just to be clear on that. I don't believe that's what it was. Can that be a violation of this passage? I would say that sounds like it would make sense to me, absolutely. If unintelligibility mm-hmm. is the disconnect for edification, in other words, if intelligibility is essential to edification, then making it unintelligible, even if it is broken uh, English you know, for us, uh, would certainly fall in the lines of application to where we would need to heed the words of Paul for that, for sure. If there was a, a I was not making sense preaching, for example, um, and uh, I don't know, it kind of reminds me of some, anyway, I shouldn't go there, some funny movie lines that I can think of on that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would just say that, um, yeah, I think, I think it could be a legitimate application. It'd be interesting to think through kind of how that could play itself out. Um, but certainly uh, what I would say based on that question is they have an understanding of what's really going on in the passage and uh, lack of intelligibility is an issue. I just don't want it to cave into lack of intelligibility meant that this was not actual human languages. It was some other m- mumbling sort of thing, which frankly may have been going on in the church. You know, there's a distinction that some uh, authors make, uh, even the Puritan um, it goes back a long time. Several people have identified that when Paul uses the word tongue singularly, he is talking about like a gibberish babble. And when he turns, when he uses it uh, uh, plur- in the plural, tongues, he's meaning real actual human languages. I-, I found that, I didn't draw that out in my messages because I I wrestled with, in the Greek, trying to figure out if that really was supported by the context, but it's at least worth bringing out now. It's kind of like when I met, like, prepare a message. There's a lot of, I call it kids that don't get to go to Disneyland. Everything that gets into my message, those are the kids that go to Disneyland. There's a lot of kids for as long as I preach (laughs) that get cut out of the message and do not get to go to Disneyland. And that's one of them. Yes. So um, So there's something there. You kind of associated unclear speech with um, like broken English. Would you, and like the reverse, like really flowery speech or like really big words used in a sermon or even just like sharing, you know what I'm saying? Well, I would only stop there to say that the, the, 
the hearer mm-hmm. may not be able to keep up, and that's not to insult anybody, yeah. but they might not understand the person because of their limited understanding of certain language, right? right? Vocabulary. That so, would be different. You're yeah, saying. I mean, yeah, that would be different. I would more say that the entire room can tell this is not this is this, this is in English, right? It's a language, but it's unintelligible. I, I, the word like d- deduction, we can deduce that as an application to what that question is saying, but right. it's not the center central point. Um, and we shouldn't make too much of something that isn't the central point of a passage. Yeah. Did you have anything else to add, Chris? I know you uh, opened up there. No, Scott okay. ended it with taking kids to the pool, and I'm good. <laughs> to Disneyland. To Disneyland. Oh, sorry, sorry, Not Disneyland. The pool. the pool. I've heard you say the pool. I've heard you say the pool. When it's really hot, you talk about... No? Okay, guys. Okay, this needs to end. Don't Well, Disneyland's <laughs> closed. You can't take any kids to Disneyland. You should try right. to start taking kids to the pool because Disneyland's not open. Oh, okay. Boy. Okay. Oh, man, come on. Focus. Let's do the next question. Okay. What does scripture say about the Buddhist philosophy of detachment? Uh, in parentheses here, that emotional and mental attachments bring suffering and should be avoided. Are we meant to lean into emotional suffering as Christians? Is there any truth to this aspect of Buddhism? Uh, read it again, because I, I, I know we can. there's yeah. multiple directions to go there, okay. so read that one more time. What does scripture say about the Buddhist philosophy of detachment? That is, the emotional and mental attachments bring suffering and should be avoided. Are we meant to lean into emotional sufferings as Christians? Is there any truth to this aspect of Buddhism? So should we detach from anything that might bring us suffering, emotional and mental attachments that would bring us suffering? Should we detach from them? Yes. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Yes, I understand. I knew where you were going. Yeah. <laughs> but well, on me, this, I don't me, know. He answered the question, yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. Let me go I first I understand what here. you're saying. Yeah, yeah we I can answer this. I do as well. And I will okay. say I, I'm, I'm an amateur in the field of Buddhism and lack a total in-depth understanding of this. So to be clear, but on the detachment and on the idea of like leaning into emotional sufferings and is there truth to this, just on, on a general principle, there's, there's not truth to this Buddhist principle of detachment. I, can, I, I just think of several verses, but one that comes to mind, um, and again, this is by way of application, because this verse is not about that, but we can apply it. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, so detachment, um, and, and again, I'm not going to say like Buddhist attachment means all of these things, because right. I, I don't have that by memory or by study. But the idea that to say what we need is to detach and live a more emotionless life and a, a life devoid of desire, devoid of all these things, I would say, no, no, no. We can lean in, not so much to emotional struggle as if we pursue it, but when we struggle, and that can be against our own uh, just life that we still sin, that can be suffering of our own body, that can be uh, being sinned against. There's many various trials. We count it joy. We consider it with our minds and our, our, our inner man a joy to walk through this precisely because not we will be detached of uh, um, all desire, but that we will grow to maturity. The testing of your faith produces what? Not detachment, not an empty void, not, you know, um, you know, leaving this earthly body and living all this. No, it produces steadfastness, which brings maturity. It talks about perfect and complete, and that word really is mature, lacking in nothing. That's what we want, not a detachment. Right. Yeah, I think the danger in this in some sense could be the sort of let go and let God mentality, you know, as it pertains to struggles and suffering and hurt, this idea of detaching is the way towards healing. And I think I want to put a big break there and say that the Buddhist philosophy of detaching from emotional struggles is cutting you off from the Lord who in those emotions and in that struggle is the one you should be leaning into, not to your emotions. Right. You should be taking your emotions to the Lord. We don't do a sort of... So the, the, the difference between most world religions and Christianity is most world religions are going to say the answer is to deal with something inside of you. Uh, so whether that is to detach from something or... But the answer is inside. And we would say, no, the answer is not inside. The answer is outside. The answer is, to the, is go to the Lord, is lean into the Lord. And so you bring those 
those things, God is sovereign in such a way that you think about uh, what goes on in a person's life. And then if you were to compare your life, like my life, to what goes on in your life, we're living different lives. Sure. We're, we're engaged in different trials, and the Lord has sovereignly handpicked those things in our lives to conform us to the image of Jesus. That we know and you just read about, right? So uh, those being different, those trials being different, God's working those things out in their own unique way such that there could have been a bunch of different ways he could have brought about your sanctification. He chose the very specific ones, and he's such a gracious God that he's only letting certain things in that are for your good, Romans 8, 28, right, to conform us to Jesus' image. And so if that's the case, then I think we look at all of those as um, God uh, of his, in his sovereignty allowing these trials that we might be mature and complete lacking in nothing or as 1 Peter 1 I would just add to what Chris was saying that if necessary you've been grieved by various trials if necessary who determines that well the Lord mm -hmm. the Lord knows um rejoice now for a little while if necessary you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ that's what you're going to miss if you do, if you just try to remove yourself from the struggle you'll remove yourself from the maturity process right. you'll mature you you'll remove yourself from the the dross process by which god heats up the fire of your life and you like silver all the impurities are melting off as God allows certain trials, certain things into your life that we can trust him for because he's a good God to only allow that which would be appropriate for us to be um, matured and strengthened and grown in our faith and our love for him. So I don't think we run away from those things. I would take us to one other place, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. So, so not to even expand on this, have the answer go too long, but this is the work of God. It's not a work to detach us, maybe to take our eyes off of the world, yeah. maybe an idol of the heart that, that is an issue that he will, he will take us from. We can call that a detachment, but not from emotion entirely because the comfort and the mercy of That's God a helpful distinction. Comes, into our, comes into our heart to minister to us. Why? So that we can then minister the comfort of God uh, with which we've been comforted by two other people in any affliction they find themselves in. So we become yeah. useful to the Lord in ministry for the very suffering um, that we will endure and that he sets into our lives. That's a good point. And I think I'm really glad you said that because I was just thinking about it from the perspective of suffering in general through trials and, and you'd kind of gone down that road, but um, some suffering we bring upon ourselves yeah, and some suffering is because of idols. And when it is because of things that we have attached ourselves to that we should not, that are becoming ultimate in our lives, that's called an idol. Any good thing that becomes a God thing Thing needs to be a thing we dump. And so that detachment is good. That would be repenting. That would be turning from that sin. And, uh, and sometimes with that detachment, there's suffering from it, right? Um, you think about it, you know, there's whole kinds of things, uh, relationships you shouldn't be in doing things sexually. You shouldn't do, uh, when you break that off, you, you don't think there's some attachment there that you're going to have sure. to fight yep. against. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a whole different aspect of it. And, and why, again, I think, that's not the Buddhism principle, though. So right. don't confuse the two. Idolatry and Buddhism is different because the process by which and the reason for which we do that are different. Mm -hmm. It's great, great clarity around that question. I really appreciate your guys' answers. So that concludes our mailbag episode for today. I just wanted to remind you guys, if you want to send in a question, you can visit our website at doxachurch.net at the top uh search bar, click resources, and then go down to Doxologic Podcast. You'll find a link at the bottom of a page to submit your own questions so we can keep doing these mailbag episodes that, like I said, hopefully are inform informative and edifying. Thanks, guys. Till next time. Thank you. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit doxachurch.net.